the sermon this evening is called Faith, Hope and Love. And uh, we're looking at the opening of the, of the letter that Paul writes uh, to the church there. So let's hear this evening the breathed out word of God. Uh, from verse 1, Paul, Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, you know what kind of men we prove to be among, among you for your sake. This is the word of the Lord for us this evening. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for this letter uh, that we have that has been written to an ancient church, uh, yet speaks uh, great relevance, truth and life to us today also. May we study the context, may we study the words that are given here in this letter, that we too will be filled with faith, hope and love as your servants and your followers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We start off with this introduction here of, of three men. So often we have in Paul's letters, it'll say Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or Paul, a slave of, uh, of, of Jesus Christ, um, where here he's, he opens up with uh, the there's, there's three names who, who are given. But what we'll find, even though there's three names as it's presented here, he moves into using I, I ask this, I do this. So we know that it's Paul writing this primarily, but he's doing it on behalf of Silvanus and uh, Timothy as well. Now, you might know Silvanus as Silas. If you're more familiar with the book of Acts, you've seen uh, Silas, Silvanus, uh, and that is actually the same person there. These three men are, are fascinated by this, this kind of trio that we have here because they are a missionary uh, group, these three men who plant churches. Uh, you might be familiar with the, the disagreement that Paul has early on in Acts with Barnabas. He's been laboring with Barnabas for a time. And then they have such a, a severe disagreement that they have to part ways. And it's basically, you're going to go and do ministry this direction. I'm going to go do ministry in that direction. And what Paul does is he takes Silas with him. And then they meet Timothy, and then Timothy joins them as they go and minister the gospel, uh, planting churches. Actually, why don't you just turn with me? So I want to I want to show you where the the basis for the church here comes from. Let's turn to Acts, and off, this is often what we find when we read Paul's letters. We can also link them back to the book of Acts um, to see where there's been missionary work. So let's go to Acts, and we'll go to chapter 16, and this. This section through here is really where there is this Macedonian ministry taking place. And Thessalonica um, is part of Macedonia, and this is what we would call Greece. So if you're wondering where, where is this sort of fit in, this is the, uh, the location. All right. And so if you've got the ESV, you'll actually see that chapter 16 starts with Timothy joins Paul and Silas. That's the heading that comes in the ESV there. And as you read through, you, you learn of the, the three of them doing all of this missionary work, going to the synagogues, preaching the gospel, and some believe and some don't. Some want to uh, uh, stone them or imprison them, and they do end up in various uh, types of trouble throughout there. But as they're going through, this is exactly the place where it all goes down. So chapter 17, if you turn over to there... Um, it says uh, in chapter 17, verse 1, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, uh, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on the three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, who I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded. So some hear the gospel preached. That's what he's just done, right? He's proclaiming the death, the suffering of Christ, and the resurrection, what we do each Sunday as we come together. Uh, what we'll do in Easter as we celebrate this time, and that it was necessary for Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead, and he's proclaiming to them that he is the Messiah. And he's in a Jewish context when he goes into the synagogue, so he's reasoning with them from the Old Testament. He's reasoning with them from the scriptures which they knew, and he's showing them that this is Christ, this is the Messiah, uh, the one whom you killed 
is truly him. And so as we go from here, verse 4, some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. And so it goes on to share all these stories. So if you're not very familiar with the book of Acts, work through these chapters or work through the book of Acts and, and see where this comes from. But as we now return to our letter, 1 Thessalonians, we have a bit of context. These three men have been laboring together to advance the kingdom of God. They've been taking up the great commission that was given to them and they've been going, preaching, making disciples, regardless of what comes their way, regardless of whether people have been upset with them because many believe even though some don't. And as a result of the many believing, what do you do? If you go to a place where they haven't had the gospel and there's no church, no true church of, of Jesus Christ, and you preach the gospel and there's many who come, what do you got to do? You got to plant a church. You got to start a church in that particular location. You have to go to the letters then like 1 Timothy uh, and, and Titus and see how it's taught then to raise up elders and deacons to serve in the church and care for the church in those places. And so here we have these three men, primarily Paul, yes, but with these other laborers in Christ. And so right from the get go here, we, we see a unity of, of people coming together. And this is the same very thing that we're doing when we go out, when we are here together, when we help other people become disciples. We are together on mission for God, just as these men were. Don't, don't ever have this idea when it comes to mission work that that's the special work that people do when they travel overseas. And only some people are called to missionary work. All Christianity is mission for God. Whether you are going and being sent to a workplace, whether you are here and you're laboring to help make disciples of Jesus, it is all the mission of God. Don't be confused by the going overseas or not going overseas. We live in a, uh, a gospel desert here in Australia where uh, so many are not preaching the gospel. We live in, in, a, in a really a pagan place now that is a, is a mission field. And so we together labor like these men have done historically as well. Um, this is to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. I love these two words coming together. This is often a very common phrase in the letters, grace and peace, grace and peace to you in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace. And, and, I, and I love the order of these two words as well. If you think of grace and peace, to have peace in your life, and that's what you know, who doesn't want peace in their life? I don't meet too many people who would say, I'm looking for chaos, right? Um, we want to have peaceful lives. But if you want peace, you first have to have grace. And that only comes through believing upon Jesus Christ to receive the grace and mercy that comes through the gospel. And so that's why grace and peace is the order in which this, this phrase is given as well. And so he says, we thank um, uh, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And those beautiful words to write about a church. We thank God for all of you and here are the reasons why. And we mention you always in our prayer. I'm constantly praying for you is what they're saying here. We love you. We are hearing about you. And it fills us with such great joy. We're giving thanks to God as a result. And so verses 2 to 3 show the, the joy and expression, the thankfulness that God has. For, uh, that, sorry, the thankfulness that Paul, Silas and Timothy have uh, thanking God for this particular church. We get the sense when we read through here, this church is a blessing to Paul. They are people that he thinks of. And, and I don't know, when he's, maybe when he's thinking about the church in Corinth, uh, the, the, the Corinthian church, I don't think he's sort of feeling necessarily the same way. He's thinking about, oh, what have I got to correct there? What will I have to do when I, when, I, when I write to them? But when he thinks about the Philippians or he thinks about the church in, in Thessalonica, he is blessed and he loves these people because they, they've... They've just been laboring for God. They're a great joy to him. And so he gives thanks constantly in his prayers. And verse 3 then gives us these things that he's actually thankful for. Um, so when we consider the context of Paul's thankfulness, imagine what a church, uh, the, the news of the church would be like to Paul, who labors so hard. We've only got to read through the book of Acts to see all of the trials and the sufferings of Paul. 
as he continues to go forth uh, proclaiming the good news. And he just has so many people hating him and against him the whole time. He's constantly at uh, doing battle with people who are, who are wanting him removed and silenced. And so he hears that his labor has not been in vain. It must be such a, a beautiful news that comes back about the church in, uh, in Thessalonica. He hears about them and, oh, this has been worth it. You remember when we went there, Paul, uh, uh, Silas, Timothy, remember when we went out there and we, we started the church there? They're thriving, they're, they're laboring for the gospel, and it's so good, it's so comforting, and it's so encouraging for them. And so what does he remember? He remembers their faith that he's hearing about. He's, he's praying thankfulness because of the hope, the steadfast hope that they have, and the love. So it's faith, hope, and love that is captured in this section of Scripture. These are the three qualities that Paul is thankful for. And so whenever we read through, through New Testament letters, we often find faith, hope, and love together. There are three characteristics or three qualities that mark Christians. So the early church... If you were to get to know people in the early church, what would you find from them? You would find faithful people, people full of hope, and people that are loving, that is biblical love grounded in the, in, in the person of God, in the, uh, the person of Jesus Christ. Those are, the, those are three distinguishing, and, and God willing, that will be what people encounter of us. If they could say, well, what was it about those Christians at RBC? What was it about that family that I, I met from that church that time? They might not be able to articulate it like this, but hopefully what they get from us is people of faith who have believed in Jesus Christ and are convicted, uh, uh, convinced of Jesus and what he has done for us. Hopefully they get from us as well a steadfastness of hope. We're not people who are walking around fearful. We're not people when they meet us and we've got to tell them, oh, have you been careful of this? And have you watched out for that? And you know, there's all these things. And we're just always bringing up the bad news every time that we should be people who have good news to proclaim because we have a very great savior. And we should be people who are uh, uh, built upon the love that is demonstrated in, in Jesus Christ. Uh, let me just give you another passage where these three turn up, this faith, hope, love. This is uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Uh, there's multiple examples of the faith, hope, love turning up in Scripture. But I'll give you just this, uh, these five verses and you'll see these words appear again, talking about the believers and what's taking place here. So, it says, uh, Romans 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So we're justified by our faith that's been given to us as a gift putting our faith, our belief, and our trust in Jesus. And as a result of this, we are people who have peace with God. And this has come to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Christian hope is not vague, I hope it's going to work out. It is a steadfast, sure hope. It's a hope that is assurance. Uh, that, we, that we have in the things of God. Verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and, in, and endurance produces character. And what does character produce? Hope. Because we've been there before. We've walked through the storm and the trial, and we now have hope because we've seen God deliver us. We've seen God walk and secure us, even in trials, even in various challenges that we face. Verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's, again, here's another, that characteristic again, love. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So, a good conclusion for what will be the result of sinners who become born again of the Spirit of God, God's Holy Spirit at work, they will become people who have faith, hope, and love demonstrated all the way through Scripture. So let's see how Paul now describes these. He puts a little bit more uh, uh, information with this. He doesn't just say faith, hope, and love. He actually gives a, a, a description here, and he says that he's being thankful for their work of faith, their work of faith. Have a look at this. Uh, this comes from, um, we, thank, we give thanks to God always for you, constantly mention you in our prayers, uh, remembering before our God, this is verse 3, and Father, your work of faith. All right, we're going to see work of faith. When we see love, we'll see labor of love and hope. We will see steadfastness of hope. This first one, work of faith. 
This is the work that comes from our faith. We know well by now, we talk about this on a regular basis, we are not justified by works. We're not saved by the works that we do. We are, we are saved, we are justified by faith alone, declared righteous in God's sight by faith. However, as it's been said many times before, true faith is busy. If you are a person who would say, I have faith, you are somebody then who is busy. Your faith produces a type of work for God, for his kingdom. Uh, this is the result of being born again of God. It produces good works for the kingdom, for the church, for the neighbor, for the family member, uh, for the one who is in need. This is what comes from us as a result. doesn't qualify us, doesn't save us or sanctify us. It is a result of being somebody who has faith. So when Paul now hears about this church in Thessalonica, he has heard of them. He has seen them in action. He knows that the saving faith that they have is true because he sees an outworking of it. They are at work uh, with those around them. They are making disciples. They are working joyfully for the Lord as a result. Faith leads to being busy for the Lord. It doesn't just lead to being busy in life. Uh, all of us can be actually really, really busy in life, can't we? We can fill up our schedule, our timetable. We could say yes to every single invite that we get. And we could pack a calendar and a, and a, and a monthly planner. We could pack that out and be completely busy but how much of it was actually work of faith? How much of it was actually building for the kingdom of God? Uh, when he hears this then, as, as, we, as we understand it, this isn't just a people who know how to answer, uh, uh, give, give clear descriptions of the teachings of Scripture. They're not just a people with knowledge. They're not just a people who are um, built up in, in being able to say and articulate the right truths. Now, that's got to be a part of who we are. That's got to be a massive part of who we are. If we don't have truth, if we don't have knowledge, we're, we're just going nowhere with it, right? Uh, we're not building upon the, the truth of Jesus Christ. But it's got to lead somewhere. It's got to lead to action. And that's why he's thankful they are people who have a work of faith. This is the case with the church in Thessalonica. Now, he knows also their work of faith, but he talks now about their labor of love. Have you ever used that phrase? I've heard people talk about it and they... They usually mean when they say, oh, that one's been a labor of love. Have you ever had someone use that expression with you? They're indicating that, well, oh, that was some hard going when we did that. So it was some sort of act of love that they were, they were uh, pursuing or in, trying to do. Uh, and it, it seemed to stress them out or work them hard or cause a, cause a sweat, basically, is what, is what this is. And so when Paul then thinks of their labor of love... He has in mind not something just like, oh, they do some nice things for people at times. They don't just cook a meal and drop off to someone's house and here's a kind act that they did. It's actually something that is called labor. It's work. So the love is not disconnected from actually working. Uh, it's actually from, from a Greek word, uh, kepos, which emphasizes, the emphasis of this Greek word is laborious toil. It is labor. It is hard work. It's an unceasing hardship for the sake of love. I think that's important to get that context. Not just labor of love. I think we can be so nicey-nicey sometimes with the word love. We can just be really kind of like, oh, we just, you know, some Christians say that, that gross phrase, they're going to love on them. Uh, I try not to use that. Um, that love or, or, or pour out some love or, or this sort of stuff. Um, biblical love is a, is a labor of love. It is a work that it's going to cause a, it's going to bring up a sweat. There's going to be, you're going to go away exhausted at times. It's going to be at times inconvenient. It's going to be some hardship in this love. And that's, that's real love, right? Anybody who has loved another in terms of a relationship will be able to say there has been times where it has been so hard, right? Because it's been a labor of love. So Christianity Biblical Christianity will have times of exhaustion, will have times of hardship and fatigue for the sake of this thing called love. So we ground this then, and we have to make, a, make the right connection with where do we see the greatest act of love? That is Jesus Christ crucified. There is no greater love than when one lays down a life for another. And this is shown to us biblically in Jesus Christ who laid down his life for us. And this was absolutely a labor of love. There was nothing pleasant, 
nice or easy about being crucified before mankind for our sins. Jesus Christ demonstrates to us, first and foremost, the labor of love, the extent that he has gone to for the sake of our redemption to bring us out of darkness and to save us. So, uh, so we are able to do these labors of love not because we've got it all together, not because we're so well equipped or that we're growing in all these things, but because we look to Christ as our example and the labor of love that he has had uh, for us. And then finally, this, this, third attribute, uh, this third characteristic of hope, he talks about a steadfastness of hope. So this is the third quality about the Christians that Paul is thankful for. They are secure with a steadfastness in hope. And uh, I said this a little bit earlier. But when you think of the word hope, there's, there's two ways to use it. There's a, a non-biblical way to use the word hope and then a biblical way to use it. The non-biblical way to use the word hope is, um, I hope I get enough time at the end of the week to do such and such and such. It may not happen, right? That's the type of hope that is the non-biblical version. And we would use that fairly regularly in our, in our, uh, our lives to say, oh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to go on a holiday or hopefully we'll be able to get this done or that done. And we would use hope fairly flippantly like that in that context. And it doesn't mean to us that we'll actually be able to get to do it. But biblical hope is assurance. It is secure because it is given to us by Jesus Christ, the promise keeper who said he would lay his life down for us. And he did. And therefore, we have hope of, a, of eternal life, meaning that it is secure and we are fully assured. So when I say I have hope that I will be with God for all of eternity, that I will dwell with Christ um, for all of eternity, I hope that I talk about there. I'm not saying I hope when I get there, it works out for me. I'm not saying that when I stand there before the judgment seat of, uh, of Christ that I hope I'm going to do OK. I'm able to say I have hope because of what Jesus Christ has done for me at the cross. So I want you to receive that tonight. I want you to see biblical hope. I want you to be able to walk out of here at the end of this service with an assurance. If you have turned from your sin and put your trust in Jesus, you have steadfastness of hope, just like the church in Thessalonica has here. I pray to God for the forgiveness of my sins. He said he will forgive me and he has done it. It is finished. He said he would send the Messiah to atone for my sins. He sent him. He did atone. It is finished. I pray now each week. I ask for certain things. This is me speaking to you now about what I pray for here. I ask for certain things and I pray God send RBC people who want to grow in Christian faith and maturity. Here you are because I pray them. I have hope and assurance that comes from being a child of God and having union with Christ. He sends them. He continues to answer my prayers as a result. God sends laborers. He is answering prayers. Your hope is certain and sure. Heaven is certain and sure. Eternity and salvation are yours in Jesus Christ. So it produces a confidence, not in ourselves, but in God who gives this hope. Verse 4, as we move on, says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. This word chosen comes up for us here. And I think... Um, when I, when I first came across Reformed theology and things like what we're going through in the morning series of the, the doctrines of grace, I went through this time, time where I would read the Bible then and it was like everywhere I looked, I just saw the sovereignty of God. I just saw phrases that just showed God is in control, in charge of my salvation and election and uh, God's sovereign choice and all these things. They're just everywhere in the text, right through the Old Testament right through the New Testament. And here we see it again, just in these few words that are given to us here. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that God has chosen you. It's good news that God has chosen you rather than you choosing God. And it's a very good thing to take a hold of. I want you to have that because if it was up to you, let's, let's reverse the situation. And we said, wow, I'm so hopeful, guys, because you have chosen God. Then I'm putting my hope in you and your ability to be somebody who is good enough to be able to hold on to God. My hope is not in your ability to hold on to God. My, God my, my hope is in God who is holding on to you, who will not let you go, who has chosen you, who has secured your salvation, and he is seeing it through to the end. He has begun the work and he will finish the work. And so we see it in the text coming up and up again. And it shouldn't be confronting to you by now to read the words that he has chosen to you. It should be heartwarming. It should be uh, building your, your hope and your assurance that God did this very great thing. 
It's the doctrine of election. That, that this love that God has for us in the present, he has, it, uh, he has had this from before the foundation of the, of the world and he remains faithful and true and will see this through for us. I just think about, about this reality for all of us. Um, when we talk about being loved by God, it's a, it's a great thing to think of that, right? Like, man, the, the God of the universe loves me and loves you. He has chosen me in, in this way. But what blows my mind is that he has loved you for a very long time. He has loved you and known you for thousands and thousands of years from before he built the earth, before he laid the foundations. He has known you. He didn't just look ahead and see you. He knew you, meaning that you were his You were his people. We are his people. And so what he does with the ones that he has called, that he has chosen, that he sends a preacher to and calls them in by the gospel, he adopts you as his own into his own personal family. He's called you out of darkness and made you a child of God. And so uh, stories of adoption always warm our hearts, right? The, the one who was left stranded, the one who was um, outside of a family and then was brought into a loving family, that warms our heart. Think of that in the context of, of God in all of his creation, that he has adopted us into his own, his own family. And this happened, of course, through the work of Jesus Christ um, giving the ransom, uh, giving the, the sin, paying the sin debt at the cross, that we would enter into this family of his. And so he says there, now connecting verse 4 and 5, because it's, it's still one sentence. He says, for we know, this is verse 4, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So let's examine a few of these phrases that Paul uses. This is classic Paul, long sentences, Packed with meat, packed with meaning as we go through. Gospel came to you not only in word. First thing there, it has to come in word. The gospel, the the doctrines of scripture, the, the, the information about God has to come in words. That's how, that's how the, the message gets um, going from one person to the other. Um, it has to come in word. There is no such thing as salvation without the word. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as I, I was just thinking one day, right? It's, it is always connected with the living word of God. So it's always word, the word when it comes to salvation. The gospel contains words that must be spoken. We think of uh, verses like in Romans where it says, how will they believe unless they hear? What are they going to hear? Not just the bird chirping, right? They're going to hear the proclamation of the word of God in particular the gospel. And how will they hear, how will they believe unless someone preaches? So never move on from the preaching of of the gospel and never move on from the word. Yet Paul builds on the idea now because I I could have come to you tonight and made a message that was nothing about scripture and I could have said it uh, as the best, you know, uh, public speaker I could ever try and be and I could try and give a demonstration and you could say, wow, that was quite a a good performance of speaking. You know, he didn't say um very much. He was, you could talk about the, the delivery of all the things that I was able to do or not do and it still have no power. Zero power because it is not connected with the word. And so when we preach the word, we have to understand it is always power. There is power in the word because it is not our word. It's not man's ideas. It is God who has given his word to us. I preach to you tonight, not Warren McKenzie's ideas. I preach to you from the scriptures that you would receive power tonight to be moved, to be encouraged, not by my stories, but by the power that comes through the word of God. Think about this word power as well, connecting it with Romans 1. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. So the gospel comes always with power. So it's word, it is power. And where is the source of this power? This is the Holy Spirit of God. And this is what he says here, that it came to you not only in word, but it came to you in power and it came to you in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So further understanding gospel proclamation then and what the preaching of the word is, not simply words or ideas, but it is power to save sinners. That's the difference. It is power to redeem you from hell. It is the very power when these words go out to save you from yourself and from your sins that will, that will be the reason you go to hell, right? 
And so when the gospel proclamation comes to you, you are redeemed from uh, from sin slavery, you are redeemed from hell because power has come to you through the, through the word. And this is a work of the Holy Spirit as he brings this word to you and regenerates you, giving you a new heart with new desires. He will put his spirit within you and cause you to walk in his ways. Friends, this is the power that will save a sinner, take them from darkness to light. This is the power that will change whole families this is the power that will change a school community or a, a, even a, 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 a town, a nation. The word is a power that you cannot stop. You cannot control it. God's word will continue to go out. If we stop preaching, the rocks will cry out, right? doesn't matter uh, what, what takes place in terms of the, the fallenness of man and the, the fact that Australia would be seen as a bit of a wasteland in terms of Christianity these days. It doesn't matter because God will raise up preachers and they will preach his word and people will get saved. His kingdom will continue to advance. We should remember it's not us who are building Jesus' church. Jesus will build his church. The power of the, world, uh, of the word will continue uh, to go out. And so the source of the power, the Holy Spirit, this is the third person of the Trinity. He is at work bringing the results of salvation, bringing people to himself. Uh, the news of Christ's death and resurrection is proclaimed and the Spirit is regenerating sinners and bringing them to himself. And this, therefore, brings full conviction. Full conviction, a true demonstration of power, power that does redeem and truly does change hearts. Uh, I want to just speak about the, the power that I've, I've witnessed in, in the gospel, not the fact that I've received it in my own life. And I went from not caring about God whatsoever to being absolutely just taken over by God's spirit that I could not do anything else but seek him for the rest of my days. That's power that I've uh, talked about experiences. That's, that's, that's my reality. But I also remember hearing the preaching of the gospel in one particular occasion, I was sharing with this with a friend recently, re reminded me of this, was I went to a funeral a number of years ago for a, a teacher who had died of cancer at a very early age. And this particular teacher was very popular. Uh, lots, this, it was, it was a, a church was massively filled up with people, not from churches, that, uh, from a secular um, community of, of musicians and singers. And it was probably one of the darkest funerals and weightiest funerals that I've ever been in. It was a young person who had died, so there was always, there's always a heaviness when you go to a funeral in that type of context. But I think one of the hardest things to sit through was just all of the people coming up and giving these false ideas like she's in, in heaven now, she's an, she's, a, she's an angel with wings, and um, she was such a great person, and she, you know, it was just all this praise for this particular person, and it was actually really heavy to sit under. It was, it was, just, it was sad, it was, it was wrong, and it just felt so dark. Like it was a beautiful church building, but inside it was just so heavy. And so anyway, it turns out that in the later uh, days of her life, she had turned to Christ and she had um, believed the gospel and, and I've, uh, believed this person to be saved. Uh, and what she had actually asked the preacher who was doing the funeral said, please, when you do my funeral, make sure you preach the gospel. Like I'm going to have, so, I'm going to have people there who come because I've got a lot of friends. When they're there, I want you to preach the gospel to them. And so the, this preacher, when he was standing up there, was faithful to the call to preach the word of God. And he stood before everybody after everybody had been saying all these lovely things and all these false things and everything that was going on. And he referred to this picture of, of, this, of this lady and he said, this person knew that they weren't good enough to get into heaven. They knew that they couldn't get in on their own merit. And everyone was like, hang on, remember we just had like an hour of saying how great they actually were? And he said, now don't shoot me, I'm just the messenger here today, but what I've been asked to preach to you is the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ, through his death. This guy went on to preach the gospel just confidently, boldly, and, and, just, and it was like light flooded in through those windows. All of a sudden, this heaviness that, was, that I felt upon me was lifted up as the light of the gospel was proclaimed in this room. And there was hope because Jesus Christ was proclaimed in this place. Not just a lady who had who'd been nice to people, a, a true Messiah, a living God who took on flesh, came to people and gave his life in our place that we could be saved from our sin and rescued from all that this world has to offer. And so that's power, right? Power to change lives, 
power to take you and I out of our foolishness, out of our sinful ways, out of our pride and our ego, and transfer us to the kingdom of the beloved Son. Have you come? Have you come to Christ? Come tonight. Receive him. Receive him as Lord because he is the true reigning king who gave his life in the place of sinners. We believe in his death and his resurrection. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Paul moves from this thanksgiving. He, he moves on to the power of, of the, the gospel preach. And as we go next week, we're going to look at imitating Paul, imitating each other in Christ, in ultimately imitating Christ, which is this last section here. But we're not going to touch this tonight. This is just the section where he says, you know what type of men, what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. So that's where we're heading as we go next week. As we consider tonight, these three areas of faith, hope, and love. I hope you've been stirred. I hope you've been able to look at these and be stirred up to, uh, to, to, to love being a person who has been given faith, to have hope that's not worldly ideas of hope, but has a, you have a biblical full assurance of what we've been given, and love that is not just vague and, and, and floating around out there in, in different ideas, but love that is seen and demonstrated to us in the crucifixion, the laying down of Jesus' life for us. And may we continue to grow and have faith, hope and love for each other, for our families, for our community. Do you have Christianity then that involves a work of faith? And so that's something we can ask of ourselves. I want to be like these people that Paul's able to give thanks for. I want, to, I want my life to continue to grow, that I have a work of faith, that there is action. I don't just have the words. I don't just stand before you and preach, that, but when my family see me and when my uh, other people are around me, that they can know that this man is genuine about his faith, not because I'm putting it on, but this is just naturally where it's going to lead. I want to have a work of faith in my life. Likewise, I want to have a labor of love. Now, it's hard at times, right? That's because it's a labor. And this side of the fall, labor is hard. We do things by the sweat of our brow. There is pain involved in working. And so therefore, to truly love others, there's just going to be some painful moments that we're going to have ahead of us. All right? We shouldn't be surprised by that. A church community is going to have naturally some painful moments as we love one another. Um, I, know, I know sometimes people say things like, you know, Lord, help me to love difficult people. <laughs> Um, I just, I am the difficult person, all right? You are the difficult person, all right? We all are difficult. You, some of you are so particular about certain things and, and it just bugs other people so much, right? And then they've got things that they're just bugged about by you and, and this is just a part of it. Let us have a labor of love for the glory of God. We will be sanctified together as we, as we stay the course in, uh, in this regards. And so may all glory go to God. May he work this in us. May we have a labor of love. Uh, assurance of hope and be people who have a work of faith uh, for our days and for the time that he has given to us. Let's pray.